Hello, I'm Dr. Simon Fry from the Clinical Neurophysiology Channel. In this video, I'm going to be talking about the reflex epilepsies. Previously, I've talked about photosensitive epilepsy as a separate um, item, and you can see that by following the link up above. Um, and in this video, we're going to talk about the broader range of what these can encompass. So in terms of how we define what they are, we have the ILE 1989 definition, which basically um, says that it's the um, specific trigger which will result in a seizure. Um, and there are various definitions, interpretations of that and how that pans out. And so um, the most commonly cited reflex epilepsy is actually photosensitivity. Um, but it's a little bit problematic because as I've discussed in the previous video, often those who are affected by it have seizures at other times and it's just a part of a larger epilepsy um, and it's just a feature of it. And so if I were to be coming up with a definition for a reflex epilepsy, I would personally say that it's an epilepsy with specific triggers that reproducibly and reliably trigger a seizure to the extent that it defines that epilepsy rather than being a feature of it. And in fact, I was very pleased to see that in the uh, ILA uh, website epilepsydiagnosis.org um, if you can have a read of that yourself over here but you know effectively it says uh, reflex epilepsies are characterized by the presence of reflex seizures and the absence of spontaneous seizures so I'm pleased to see that it's not just me who thinks this way. In terms of the different types of reflex epilepsies that exist we have sensory um, reflex epilepsies where it can be certain types of uh, touches um, that um, or, or tastes or smells uh, that can trigger them. Uh, maybe praxic, where maybe certain types of movements, maybe thinking thought about certain things, maybe like maths, for example, or might be certain types of emotions. And in terms of the triggers, we tend to divide them up into two groups, um, either as simple or as complex. So the simple ones tend to be external triggers, which we can easily see, and the time space between having the trigger and having the seizure is actually pretty tight. Um, so it's very uh, straightforward and simple to um, elucidate those and to link the two together. They may also be complex, but they tend to be more internal, variably uh, time uh, you know, responsive and harder overall for an observer to identify. Um, and all sorts of really fascinating uh, types, particularly around the thinking ones. Uh, sometimes it can you know, has, has been described with certain geographical locations, people going to a certain you know, place and then you know, having a seizure thereafter. So there are all sorts of uh, variations of the theme here to what those specific triggers can be for any individual. And if we think about the different parts of the brain, there, there are lots of different uh, zones which can result and manifest themselves with these different epilepsies. So the frontal part of the brain is really uh, there to do uh, our cognition, our thinking for us. The parietal region, sensory and calculation parts of the brain. The temporal lobe for our emotions and memories. Uh, it also houses some of the sensory aspects, you know, whether it's olfaction, our sense of smell, gustatory, to do with our, our taste and, and relating to our eating, auditory as well. Um, and the back end of the brain um, is really uh, relating to light and the praxic uh, areas are quite complex, as you can imagine, when it comes to having movements and they're scattered around the brain in different locations, all interlinked. So in terms of the reflex epilepsies, which some, some of them are the sort of are they, aren't they, uh, we've talked about photosensitive uh, epilepsy a little bit, where it certainly it can be, but it often uh, it's actually a feature of another epilepsy. For example, uh, JME is probably the most common um, manifestation. Um, and even with some of the more specifically light sensitive uh, epilepsies, for example, Jeevan syndrome, uh, that may not necessarily be a pure uh, reflex photosensitive epilepsy because quite often it's more relating to eye closure more than photic stimulation and certainly they can be affected by generalized tonic clonic seizures uh, spontaneously away from uh, light. And so um, yes there are certainly those who have a pure photosensitive epilepsy but most commonly it's actually a feature of another condition, another sort of larger group um, of, of, of epilepsies rather than you know, a pure one. Um, startle induced seizures are an interesting uh, group, which sort of commonly are they, aren't they? Um, 
this occurs when people have an unexpected stimulus. It's usually sounds, loud sounds, uh, just because they're the most common type of things which can give someone a startle. It might be you know, a touch or something like that as well. It tends to occur actually in secondary symptomatic epilepsies. For example, as you may have hemiparitic uh, cerebral palsy, so that's one half of their body being weak, or those with Down syndrome. Uh, people may also have thinking uh, epilepsies or called neogenic epilepsies or praxit when they have to do certain movements and those can also overlap with the more generalized epilepsies such as JME and it's actually quite rare that focal seizures are associated with those so um, again it comes under the are they aren't they and often they can be linked to regional uh, brain abnormalities but because they are often manifested, manifested uh, within you know, other epilepsies or larger epilepsies such as JME, it's really important to ask patients with those epilepsies whether there are specific triggers which may kick things off because that's quite often the case, may not always be offered up and that's why it should always be pursued in the consultations. In terms of the actual um, sort of true or, or, or the cleanest type of reflex epilepsies, reading is a, a very important one. So it's rare, it can be inherited, it tends to occur in the teenage years, uh, more amongst the males and the females. It can occur either when people are reading aloud or silently, but more often when people are reading aloud. And when people are reading aloud, it's, you know, there's a lot of jaw movement. And interestingly, in the primary reading epilepsies, um, it, when it manifests itself, it starts manifesting itself as myoclonic jerks around the mouth. And if people continue to read, um, then that can actually spread into more of a generalised tonic-clonic seizure rather than just those of the focal movements around the mouth. Um, patients may also have absences as well with them. The secondary or symptomatic type of reading epilepsy is when there's something not right in the brain tends to manifest itself as focal seizures, either with alexia when people stop being able to uh, read or dysphasias. In terms of the musicogenic reflex epilepsies, these are even rarer still. Interestingly, it tends to affect more the ladies than the men, and the onset's a little bit later in the 20s or 30s rather than the teenage years. It can be very specific pieces of music or even sets of notes, and one doesn't actually have to hear uh, the music itself. Um, one can actually just think about them for those who are affected, and it usually manifests itself as a temporal lobe epilepsy. There are certain genes, uh, as below, um, which have been identified with it, and generally speaking, one tries to avoid the specific trigger. Eating epilepsy is a really interesting group. Um, again, it's rare, uh, more common in places like Sri Lanka, often family history, so it's, you know, genes are involved. Um, tends to affect uh, the males uh, to females in sort of three to one, um, and tends to manifest itself as a temporal lobe epilepsy. Some people um, end up um, self-inducing um, when they have these eating reflex epilepsies prior to eating their meal, because once they've had the seizure, they can then go on and eat their meal in peace. Hot water or bathing epilepsy is two groups, a little bit different. Um, so the hot water ones is literally when, when the water is for specific temperature, the bathing ones uh, can be any temperature really. Um, it tends to be more common in India or Turkey, again more for the boys and the girls, and there are certain genes which have been linked to this. It usually manifests itself as a temporal lobe epilepsy, and we certainly have a very fascinating case here in our department where we were able to demonstrate a temporal lobe epilepsy occurring when the water temperature uh, was raised to a specific point. Sensations are also uh, a uh, cause of reflex epilepsies, tend to occur out of stimulating the head and neck more potent in particular hypersensitive zones. Um, it may be to do with rubbing the skin, pricking, touching, tapping, may even be tooth brushing. It tends to manifest itself first with a sensory aura, which then goes on to tonic motor seizures. A particularly interesting uh, form of sensory reflex uh, epilepsy, if we can call it that, might be emotional, it's not clear, um, are the uh, orgasm-induced reflex uh, epilepsies. Um, tends to manifest itself as a temporal lobe epilepsy, but may also uh, come out from the frontal lobes, or maybe more of a generalised one. It tends to affect uh, ladies more than the men. Um, there tends to be a reluctance uh, in discussing uh, this aspect, but you know it can have a very significant impact on quality of life. Um, and so, um, you know, it should always, you know, be thought about, you know, when asking, you know, patients if there are any specific triggers, you know, that that might be uh, one of them, and you know, that may occur in a more generalised epilepsy too. The reflex epilepsies highlight um, a really important.
uh, point about the complexity of the brain. There are huge networks which take information across large swathes of the brain from one part of the brain to the next, and they've certainly contributed an awful lot to our understanding of functional connectivity and how the different networks can interact with each other. But in terms of actual epileptogenesis itself, it's really moved our concept on from you know, just being a group of rogue neurons firing off uh, and, and triggering seizures to our modern day understanding of networks and how networks are activated and how networks spread their signals to other parts of the brain. Thanks for watching. Hopefully in the next one I'm going to be following up on networks and how um, the networks can be activated through sleep um, and how epilepsy and sleep interreact. So um, thank you as always for your support. Please do hit the thumbs uh, up below, hit the subscribe and uh, questions in general are always welcome, um, but obviously I can't answer specific ones regarding treatments. All the very best.